Hello, I'm Dr. Atisha, and I'm a plastic surgeon that is the Director of Breast Reconstruction and the Director of Microsurgery with the Henry Ford Breast Cancer Program. Breast reconstruction is um, really about reconstructing your breast after a mastectomy. Sometimes that can happen at the time of mastectomy, sometimes it happens later after somebody's gone through their cancer therapies. And you know, that's a conversation that usually happens between the breast surgeon, the patient, and the plastic surgeon. So, um, you know, there are some factors that might result in delaying the mastectomy, and you know, that's something that we can talk about later and in a little more detail. Um, but a lot of times, um, we, people are candidates for having reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy. And that looks like many different things depending on what you prefer and what you're a candidate for. Sometimes we reconstruct breasts with implants, um, and that's usually about a three-stage procedure. And sometimes we reconstruct breasts with your own body tissue, and that's generally speaking a two-stage procedure. So for implant-based reconstruction, we usually have to start off with a tissue expander. And a tissue expander at the time of the mastectomy can be placed underneath the muscle that sits under the breast. So once the breast is removed and all you have is skin and muscle, we really need a little bit of better coverage of the implant and we also need to stretch the muscle. So that's why we put in a tissue expander. It's basically a deflated implant. It's a deflated implant that has a metal port in the middle and um, I put that underneath the muscle, then we close the skin over it and on a week to week basis, we um, inflate that tissue expander so that you essentially are growing breasts. Um, now, in the beginning, you start off a little flat. Sometimes we are able to put fluid into the tissue expanders at the time of the operation, um, but you, know, you still will look a little flat and you really won't see what it will look like until we're done with your expansions um, and you're ready to go for your second stage. So the second stage um, usually happens about two to three months after the tissue expanders go in. And so what we do is we take you for a second operation, a very short outpatient operation, where we literally slip out the tissue expander with a, through a smaller incision and put in a permanent implant. Um, permanent implants can either be saline or silicone. Silicone gel implants are very safe today. They're made with a, a much um, thicker um, sort of gel, and so they don't leak, even if the outer shell were to rupture. The FDA has reapproved them for all types of reconstruction and even for breast augmentation. So, and they've been out now for over 10 years, and so they're very safe. There was never anything to show an association between um, autoimmune diseases and breast implants. So I personally like to use the silicone gel implants because in reconstruction they feel more natural and they just have a, um, they really come up with a lot of nice different ones. There's shaped ones, there's round ones, and that's a discussion that you will have with your plastic surgeon as you're getting your tissue expanders. You can start to decide what implants would best suit you. Um, the third stage is the nipple reconstruction. Some women do have the option to keep their nipple. Um, majority of the time, that's not an option, and so um, majority of the time, you don't have a nipple and you will need one reconstructed. So that is the third stage. And at the third stage is when you can also do a little bit of tweaking. Sometimes we do fat grafting to fill in some thin skin areas. Um, and then we also do the nipple reconstruction. Um, I like to do my nipple reconstruction um, a little bit differently than some people. So there's are about three or four different ways that nipple and areola reconstruction can be done. And that's also a conversation that you will have with your plastic surgeon. The second way that we can do things are with using your own body tissue. Um, and then actually the third way is with using your body tissue combined with an implant. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the second one. Using your own body tissue has been shown um, to have the highest rates of satisfaction when we've done patient satisfaction studies. Um, and it's also been shown to have the highest rates of satisfaction and quality of life over a long period of time. So the most common place that we tend to use um, your own tissue is from your belly. So if you have enough tissue down there and you don't have many operations um, and your scars are not affecting the blood supply, then you could be considered a good candidate. Um, I think in particular when we're doing a one-sided reconstruction, 
using your own body tissue is usually the best way to go about reconstruction because we can achieve the best symmetry. Um, abdominal flaps such as, and, and this is going to be, you know, something that is going to be a complicated word, but it is one you may hear very often, but the deep inferior epigastric perforator flap, also known as the deep flap, is now um, one of the more common ones that we offer here at Henry Ford now. Um, what that means is that we try to preserve your muscle and the tendon over your muscle from your abdomen and just take the skin, the fat, and the blood vessels and transfer them to the chest and to create a breast out of that. To do that, it involves sewing up little blood vessels underneath a microscope. So it's a very technically complex operation. It's called microsurgery. Um, it usually involves a little bit of longer operative times, but the beauty of it is, is that it prevents you from um, having to necessarily deal with a significant amount of abdominal weakness or getting bulges or hernias. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but we do try to decrease it by doing the microsurgical techniques. Um, sometimes people are not candidates for microsurgery reconstruction, and so they need to ha you have a belly flap with taking their entire muscle. And a lot of that depends on blood supply and just the plastic surgeon that you have. Um, the other option is to take it either from your thigh or sometimes from your gluteal region. Um, so some people who have had a tummy tuck in the past might not be a candidate anymore for an abdominal flap, but they may be a candidate for either a thigh or a gluteal flap. So that also involves microsurgery. Um, and, the, and the third thing that I was talking about is a combination of both. There's something called the latissimus flap, and the latissimus muscle is the muscle in our back that helps us to do those um, sort of um, uh, overhead pull downs. Um, and we don't need to use microsurgery when we do that reconstruction. Sometimes we just swing a little bit of skin and fat and the muscle to the front and place a tissue expander underneath that. So that involves having to have an implant as well. Um, that also involves having to get tissue expansions on a week-to-week -week basis and eventually a second stage implant, a tissue expander exchange for implant. So that's really the three types of ways that we can do breast reconstruction. Um, there are other unique options out there which you know can be discussed with your plastic surgeon when you meet them. Um, some of those options include a one-stage implant-based reconstruction. Some include just fat grafting. Those are things that we can talk about down the road. So there is one other type of breast reconstruction we should talk about, um, and it's associated with patients who choose lumpectomy. Some women who are really large-breasted um, who are going to have a sizable tumor be removed or even a sizable amount of breast tissue because they have a lot of calcifications can be considered candidates for something called an oncoplastic reduction. And all that means, in plain terms, is that when you go to the operating room for your lumpectomy and they take out a sizable chunk of breast tissue, that at, at that same operation, we can rearrange your breast tissue so that you have not something that looks like a shark bite that came, you know, and, and took a big chunk of, of tissue out of your breast. We rearrange your breast tissue almost to look like a lift and it makes the breast look a little smaller. And then we do a symmetry procedure on the other breast to make it look the same size. And the reason we do that is so that when you do go through radiation therapy, that you will have symmetry at the end when it's all said and done. If we didn't do an oncoplastic reduction, you may simply end up with a very, very a much smaller breast compared to what you have on the other side, or a much smaller breast with a very large divot. So an oncoplastic reduction is really an excellent um, option for women who are rather large-breasted who are going to have a sizable amount of breast tissue removed. Um, it's also, it's not really good for people who have calcifications all over their breast who are better candidates for a mastectomy. Um, and it's not really good for women who are very small-breasted either. So whether or not you're a candidate for an oncoplastic reduction is really a a conversation between the plastic surgeon, you, and the breast surgeon. Um, so I think that's another option to keep in mind if you're somebody who's larger breasted and you're contemplating between a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy, you do have the option of going through a reduction um, for both the breast that has the cancer and the other side.
the great thing about it is patients have great satisfaction associated with it, um, a really high rate of satisfaction. The downfall, if your final um, pathology results say that your margins are either too close or your margins are positive, in other words, there's still maybe some breast cancer left behind, we no longer know where that breast cancer is because we've rearranged your breast tissue. So that really means that you're committed to having a mastectomy. The percentage of that of time that that should happen should not be more than 5% of the time. So in my experience, um, doing an oncoplastic reduction really allows us to take more margins so that, in, so that we get negative margins at the end of the day. Um, and patient satisfaction is high. The other downfall, and why some people are not a candidate for it, is wound healing can be an issue. And so if you're somebody that has diabetes or you're extremely obese or has some type of comorbidity that could make wound healing an issue, then you're probably not a candidate for oncoplastic reduction. Women that have lumpectomies um, who don't end up being candidates for oncoplastic reduction do end up with a little bit of a smaller breast that might be more lifted. And sometimes we can do a symmetry, symmetry procedure to the other side. So symmetry to the other breast is also a big part of breast reconstruction, particularly when somebody's having a one-sided, either a one-sided mastectomy with reconstruction or a lumpectomy. Symmetry is also considered breast reconstruction when we're doing it to the other side. So that's just something I think is important for people to know, um, that you don't have to have a mastectomy to see a, a plastic surgeon for you know, and you don't necessarily, um, and you don't just necessarily have to um, have had a breast reconstruction before. We can do symmetry procedures to the other breast if needed. There has never been ever any study to show that breast reconstruction prevents people from having a detection of their recurrence. Um, if anything, there usually are more eyes on that patient um, because there are more people following that patient for a long period of time. So breast reconstruction has never been shown to cover up a recurrence, nor does it increase your risk for getting any type of uh, breast cancer in the future. So it's going to be very important that you continue your physical examination and you continue to follow up with either your breast surgeon or your oncologist, and then your breast uh, plastic surgeon should also follow you for a reasonable amount of time. And sometimes that can mean a few years, sometimes that can mean even longer than that. Um, but physical examination is gonna be the most important way to detect your recurrence. There really are a few ways that one can make a nipple. Um, the way that I typically do it is um, I usually use some excess skin from somewhere, um, usually skin that sometimes comes from the sides. After a mastectomy, a lot of women have excess skin from their sides. Sometimes there's skin um, from their hips after doing a, a abdominal flap. So we can take that excess skin and we make it the areola. So it's actually taken as a skin graft and the areola is made out of that. And the nipple itself comes from the, the breast skin, the chest wall skin, or the breast flap, whatever is there that is serving as the mound, the, the breast reconstruction mound, can be used to make the nipple itself. And the excess skin that we take either from your sides or from your hips, or even sometimes some people take it from the inner thigh or the groin region, can be used to make the areola. So after that heals, um, then about four to six months later is when you'd be a candidate to have your nipple and areolar complex tattooed so that you can get the right color in. Now go back a little bit and tell me a little bit, a little bit more about how you harvest that. So you, how, you make an incision, you take a slice. Yep. So Generally you know, speaking, for the type of nipple and areolar complex reconstruction that I do, I do have to take patients to the operating room for that. It also gives me an opportunity to fix any... Um, things that they need fixed or to tweak part of the reconstruction. Some people do the type of nipple reconstruction where they just make the nipple mound itself and they can do that under local anesthesia or sometimes under no anesthesia and they don't need to take you to the operating room for it, but you will have to get the areola tattooed in. So there really are a few different ways that you can do it and it's a discussion uh, that you can have between you and your, um, you and your plastic surgeon. There are a few people who are not necessarily candidates for breast reconstruction. 
One of those things is if you're an active smoker. Um, unfortunately, nicotine itself in any form, really what it does is it decreases the blood supply to the tissues. And so whether or not you, you know, have a nicotine patch or you're doing the gum or you're smoking, um, your risk for having what's called necrosis or dead skin after the operation is significantly higher. Um, so therefore, I, I typically don't reconstruct patients that are active smokers. You would have to wait at least two months or stop smoking or stop any form of nicotine for a minimum of two months before you'd be a considered a candidate for breast reconstruction. Other people who are not candidates for breast reconstruction are patients that have um, cancers that really need to be treated very quickly um, and you can't have any type of delay in your treatment. Um, sometimes those, those cancers in particular are inflammatory breast cancers or, um, or a really large aggressive type of cancer that needs to be uh, treated right away. And that's once again a conversation that would need to happen between your breast surgeon uh, and the plastic surgeon. And then finally, patients who have a lot of comorbidities. So if you have heart disease or bad lung disease um, or bad clotting issues, um, blood clotting issues, you're probably not a good candidate for breast reconstruction. After all, this really is elective surgery. And while reconstructing a breast mound is incredibly important to your overall quality of life and satisfaction with your outcome, um, it's, it's, it, it would be hard to justify if we're really risking your life during those procedures. So that's um, a decision that also needs to be made by you and your plastic surgeon and the breast surgeon. A common question I get from women is whether or not breast reconstruction is covered. And fortunately, um, in 1998, the Women's Health and Right Act was passed by Congress saying that insurance companies cannot refuse coverage of breast reconstruction when it's related to mastectomy reconstruction for breast cancer. Um, there have been um, more, there is more work being done right now to try to support coverage of partial mastectomy or lumpectomy defects. Um, and there is definitely another act that was passed supporting the symmetry procedure. So in general, in general, breast reconstruction is covered and is never an issue because there is, an, there is a, a law supporting that. Most recently, they've, they've, most recently, as of a few months ago, they've just passed a law saying that all women must be educated about their breast reconstruction options. And so there's really a lot of support out there, um, you know, legally and in the law for getting breast reconstruction and for not refusing it. So it's, it's typically speaking, never an issue.